so with that, I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker, Joel Schumann, who probably doesn't need introduction. He's the father of OCT. He's from NYU, and he's going to talk about RNFL imaging with different devices. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Teresa and Sanjay, and thank you, Joanne and Edie, uh, for including me in this symposium. I'm, uh, these are my disclosures. And in this uh, talk, I'll discuss RNFL imaging with different devices. These things are important for any OCT. And whether you're imaging the RNFL, the optic nerve, the macula, whether you're looking at glaucoma or retinal disease or you're looking at the cornea, these qualities are very important in getting a good quality image and being able to analyze it properly. Richard Lee is on the panel. Uh, he coined the term red disease. If you have problems with these three factors, that is something that causes red disease. So for image quality, I would urge you to make sure that the surface of the eye is well lubricated, that you're not getting artifacts because of uh, problems in image quality. These are the nominal strengths of signal that you need for the different devices. You have much of this written in your handout, uh, but just briefly, there are numbers here that represent the values that are required in order to have what is considered an acceptable image. And on the right, you see images that would not be acceptable. And you can see from where the red and blue lines are outlining tissue borders that there are some segmentation errors. In other words, the machine will give you incorrect information about tissue characteristics and thicknesses. You also want to look for particular artifacts, artifacts from blood vessel shadows. Every vessel that's carrying blood in it of a, an adequate size will create a shadow. Mirror images, if you look at this image that I'm showing you on the left-hand side of the image, you can see that the retina seems to be flipped over, and that's because of the way that the image was acquired. Blinking artifact, you've probably seen these kind of black bands on your images. This is because no signal was acquired at these points or a segmentation failure occurred. Eye movement causes artifact, as you see here. The retinal vessels don't usually have the shape that you see in the lower third of this image. These are printouts from some of the most commonly used machines uh, in the US. And so on the left, beginning from the left and moving clockwise, you have Cirrus, then Spectralis, OptiView, and Triton. And all of these devices can be used to measure the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is typically measured in a circle around the optic nerve head. When we came up with that a uh, particular way of measuring the nerve fiber layer, we were trying to capture all of the nerve tissue as it went towards the optic nerve on its way to the brain. And so the circle has persisted as a measure, a parameter that has uh, a high degree of association with health and disease and is also a very robust measure. So you can use the circle on any of these machines. On some of the machines, you can get a volumetric measurement, and you can look beyond the circle. And that will give you more information about whether or not glaucoma is present, and the shape and the character of that abnormality will tell you. But these are all healthy eyes uh, that I'm showing you here. These are glaucomatous eyes. And here, uh, uh, by the way, these are all the same uh, patient uh, for the healthy one and then the same patient for the glaucoma one uh, on the different machines. And so you can see the way that the different machines interpret uh, the same eyes. Um, and what you're, what you're looking at are these abnormalities that show up as being red or yellow, red being uh, below the first percentile and yellow being usually the first to the fifth percentile. And you can see that the abnormalities, for instance, here, have a particular location and a particular shape, and that can give you confidence as to whether or not that abnormality is truly glaucoma. 
So if the abnormality is in a place that you normally see glaucoma and it has a pattern that you normally see in glaucoma, then that gives you a high likelihood that that actually is a glaucomatous abnormality. There's no other reason for the abnormal points to line up like this. If you're looking at progression, change over time, there are some statistical programs in some of the devices. The most uh, complete uh, is in the Cirrus, as you can see here. These measures that I'm outlining are all measures taken from the, uh, I'm sorry, these three, this one, this one, and this one, are all taken from the scanning circle. And so that uh, circular measurement gives you an average nerve fiber layer thickness, which is shown here, and then the superior quadrant and the inferior quadrant are shown here. And then uh, it gives you a trend analysis that tells you whether or not there's a statistically significant difference from no change uh, that is um, being found in the regression line. This measure is of the optic nerve head. I will leave that to uh, Dr. Burgoyne to discuss. And then this measure here that you see is the RNFL thickness profile. And you can see two baseline uh, RNFL thickness profiles and then the profile from the given day. So this is an event analysis that's showing you whether there's a statistically significant difference, as you see here, inferiorly uh, from the baselines on today's scan. You can also look at the uh, actual numerical values and you have the same sort of indication of whether or not there's a statistically significant change. With the Heidelberg spectralis, you have a serial analysis, and so you're looking for change over time in a series of scans um, in this sort of a graph uh, and in these values uh, that are taken from uh, different uh, days that the patient is scanned. Unfortunately, there's not a statistical program uh, that is telling you whether or not that uh, change is statistically significant. It's up to the clinician to decide whether or not the change is clinically significant. And then here, uh, this is uh, from the OptiView, and you're looking at the change analysis on the RNFL, and this is on the GCC. I'll um, uh, leave that to Julia to discuss with you in terms of macular measures. And then here you can see the difference in the RNFL thickness profiles um, from this patient from baseline to uh, the current day. And then you do have a statistical test for trend for the RNFL uh, thickness in the GCC. So here you see that uh, regression line through the RNFL average values. When the RNFL becomes very thin, with each of these machines, you hit a floor effect. In other words, you, you reach a number that the machine won't give you a value below. So even if the RNFL has fallen to a value below that floor, it will still read that floor value. You have to be careful not to be fooled into thinking that the patient is actually stable when, in fact, the patient has RNFL so thin that the machine won't tell you that they're actually getting worse. So in summary, the OCT RNFL measures can detect structural abnormalities and progression. Uh, the RNFL outperforms the visual field, actually, in detecting progression in early glaucoma. Visual field progression can be measured, though, even when the visual field is normal. Um, we didn't have time to discuss that today. And then in moderate and advanced glaucoma, you need to be cautious about this floor effect um, because the RNFL progression rate decreases or even falls to zero if you're at the floor. And so it's important to monitor both the RNFL and the visual field in the assessment of glaucoma progression, especially in moderate to advanced disease. Thank you very much.